The CGI podcast is all about successful artists and designers sharing their personal stories and experiences to inspire you to take action, learn from others, and apply the shared wisdom to your own journey as you chase your creative potential. This is the CGI podcast. This is episode nine with lead concept artist Darren Bacon. Before we start the interview, I want to mention a free design tool that you can download from the CGI podcast website. Since starting this podcast, we've heard from lots of talented designers who are masters of their tools. For many of them, this is software. So I've taken everything I've learned over the years and combined it with tips and tricks shared by CGI podcast guests. The result is a simple workbook called Learn Any Software in 30 Days. Now there are no pretty pictures or anything in there, but I guarantee if you follow the steps and use the workbook as intended, it will get you results. This is a prototype for something bigger and better to come. In order to make this better, I want to get a copy into your hands so you can tell me what you do or don't like about it, and then I will improve it. To get the workbook, go to cgipodcast.com, sign up for the email list, and we'll send it to your email address that you used. If you're already subscribed and you still want a copy, just email me at thecgipodcast at gmail.com, and I'll hook you up. I'm interested to see what everybody thinks. I know it will work, but I'd like to know what would make it even better. All right, let's dive into episode nine of the CGI podcast. Darren Bacon is a lead concept artist at 343 Industries, a division of Microsoft, which is responsible for the Halo franchise. Before joining Microsoft, he worked on games, films, and animations at companies such as Bungie, Disney, and Electronic Arts. Darren's work features mostly sci-fi vehicles and environments that exhibit hints of retrofuturism and an understanding of traditional industrial design. The measured approach he brings to his design work brings it to life and breathes realism into each concept. Darren, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Will. Uh, thank you for the nice intro. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. So you're, uh, you're calling in from uh, the Pacific Northwest today, right? That's right. Uh, I am in Issaquah, Washington, which is like a kind of a suburb of Seattle um, and uh, near Redmond. So I go to work in Redmond and kind of, you know, commute out here on the east side. Okay. So how how long is that commute for you each day? Is it? Uh, It's not that far. It's like I'm basically on the other side of a lake uh, from Redmond. So I kind of, you know, maybe 30 minutes around the lake. And on the way in, I uh, have a nice view of some, (laughs) you know. A large body of water. That's cool. I actually used to live out in, um, I want to say it was uh, Renton, Washington. So, oh yeah, it, small little place, but you know, somewhat out there, uh, kind of Seattle suburbs as well. So, um, yeah, totally. it's beautiful out there. Yeah, it's cool uh, this time of the year, like summer. It's kind of a drag in the winter, obviously. Yeah, uh, we had like a super wet winter too. I think it broke a record for like the most accumulation of rainfall i mean obviously it went all the way up and down the west coast because like you know california was in a drought and stuff but and they're no longer but it was a it got really old around february here i can imagine yeah um so how long have you been out there uh i've moved uh, up here in 2011 from the bay area oh, okay so it's been quite a while yeah yeah i was um I went, uh, worked at Bungie from like 2011 to 2014 and then uh, jumped over to Microsoft and have been there uh, since. Cool. Well, you know, on, on that note, um, do you mind uh, catching up some people on your background? I mean, there's a lot of listeners here who, um, you know, I'm always surprised to find when uh, somebody says, oh, I never heard of such and such who you just had on. I'm like, oh, I thought they were thought everyone knew about them, but you know what? It can be helpful to kind of rewind. So um, where did you start in your kind of creative journey? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, when I was at uh, Art Center in Pasadena uh, going to school, I took a break in 2006 and did kind of like a quote unquote internship at a game studio in Seattle that's now gone. It was called Zombie. Zombie Studios. And I did a summer there and it was really um, kind of like uh, loose and informal. I was working with the the owner of the company or the CEO and just kind of like helping him on his little pet projects like sketching and doing concept art. But it gave me like my foot in the door in the game industry 
and uh, was just a really cool opportunity to kind of see how things worked. Uh, and I went back to school, and then from there I went to uh, EALA and worked there for about a year. Worked on Red Alert 3, which is a RTS game. And then uh, my now wife, then girlfriend, got a job in the Bay Area, and we decided to relocate to the Bay Area. And I knew there was some work up there, and I was uh, I knew that uh, Doug Chang was had a company, and he was sort of hiring called Image Movers Digital. And uh, Doug is like a you know was sort of like a hero of mine. Uh, for those that don't know, he was like the concept art director, I think, on like episode one and two of Star Wars. So. I sort of knew he had this company called Ice Blink and Ice Blink had all these like badass concept artists. And uh, so I, I started like bothering him and ended up getting a job there, which was really awesome. And uh, I still don't quite know how that all worked out. Uh, and I worked there for a couple of years until Image Movers went under. And when Image Movers went under, I started working. Image Movers was bought by Disney. So it was a Disney company. And it kind of got my foot in the door on the Disney side of things. So then when that went down, I started working for a Disney TV show that was back in Burbank, and I was just working remote from the Bay Area. And uh, the art director of that show was another like uh, you know hero of mine, Alberto Mieglo, so that's kind of why I jumped on that project. And then uh, my, my wife was, got pregnant, and she decided that she didn't want to return to uh, her job. She was working at a biotech in the Bay Area. And so uh, I was sort of like left with the option of either moving back to L.A. to work at the show in-house or um, I, I saw that um, Bungie, I was familiar with Bungie because like, yeah, I was a Halo fan, Halo nerd. And I, I knew that they were uh, quietly working on a project because they had split from Microsoft. And so I uh, reached out to them and uh, got an uh, interview and ultimately an offer and so then it just came down to like moving back to LA or moving to Seattle. And we chose to uh, move to Seattle to kind of do the bungee thing, which was um, just kind of like a bucket list item for me. And uh, got to work on Destiny and, and develop that. I was kind of there in the early days of that development. They were just getting going when I started there. And uh, once that sort of um, was wrapping up uh, Destiny 1, I made the switch and went over to uh, 343 Industries, which is working on uh, Halo. And that has you know, been where I've, I've been at. Uh, 343 is really cool um, if you're a concept art fan because uh, Sparth, uh, Nicholas Bouvier, he's the art director. And they've had a lot of other you know, really awesome concept artists come in and out of that department. So that was a big motivator for me to move over there and get to work with you know, that guy and, and sort of have him in, uh, an art director mentorship role has been like super awesome. And yeah, that's, that's sort of my life story. Wow. That, that's well put in, in around four minutes on the dot. That's pretty, okay. pretty cool. concise, man. Um, that's really awesome. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot in there that I'm probably going to drag you back through and, and have you elaborate on at some point, if you don't mind, um, as it makes sense. But, um, First question is, uh, did you grow up in SoCal? Were you already out there uh, or did you move? Uh, did you have to travel to start your college experience? I grew up in the Seattle area. And so when my wife became pregnant and she was kind of wanting to move back to be close to her family, it was like a perfect opportunity for me um, to make that switch with the bungee thing. I don't think I would have ever been able to get the bungee job um, had... We'd not had our first kid and not had that like motivation from her side. So it was just kind of like, you know, perfect timing. Got it. Okay. So you were, so you grew up in, in, in Washington state, you went down to SoCal for school and then you, you did some work while you were out there kind of in the process. And then this is more or less a return to home for you. Back yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I joked around a lot that I was like um, a salmon returning home to spawn and, <laughs> spawn and die. That's a very apt uh, um, analogy right there. Yeah, very Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Um, so that's what sort of uh, gave me the, the 
opportunity to get back here and to get involved at, in these companies. Um, so that was cool. Very am, cool. I'm, and, and so what, what was the, so you, you mentioned also earlier on, um, that you got to work with Alberto Mieglo and, and that was down at, um, what was the name of that studio called? So that was, uh, Walt Disney television animation. Got it. Got it. And when I got on the project, he was still in Spain, I think, cause sure. he had, he had been over there working for like a year on all of the pitch work that essentially got it greenlit. And then I saw that I got the opportunity to see the work when I was sort of being brought in. And as soon as I saw what he'd been up to, it was just like, I was totally sold. Uh, I only like met him face to face once I, I went down there and, and met the team that was in house in, in Burbank. Uh, and then the rest of the time I was, I was using, uh, so, you know, like conferencing software to kind of like join them in their weekly meetings and, uh, worked remote. Okay. So is, is that a project that ever saw the light of day or, or is that not? Yeah, they did it. They did a season of it. It it didn't get super well received. It was only aired on Disney XD, which is like, you know, kind of like some obscure Disney voice channel, I think, or something like that, or how they were, that's how they market it. Right. Right. Um, yes, I just spoke last week with um von ling who worked on the same project so yeah yeah totally yeah so i think von was in-house yep yeah it was yeah von's work on that was awesome yeah it was cool hearing a little bit about that um he's actually another guy i went to school with so uh we have a number of people in our same circles um but yeah so okay that's cool so you worked on that too um it sounds like you you had uh, a, a number of cool opportunities uh, fairly fairly fresh out of school. Um, did uh, so in in this process. So when you were when you had the opportunity to go back up to work for Bungie, um, how did how did that you know was it just your standard interview or did you have connections there already? Um, what was that experience like for you? Uh, I kind of, so it was weird. I had been bothering Bungie for a job, you know, just sort of like pinging them mm-hmm. for, for like years. Um, Cause kind of, like I said, I, w- I was just kind of a textbook fanboy. And like when I actually did come up for an interview loop, uh, they flew me up and like when the driver was picking me up at the airport, she was like freaking out when, when we finally connected because she'd been calling the wrong cell phone number because they had had like Bungie had my cell phone number on file from like, you know, three years oh. before, before or whatever, you know, cause like they had like got some it. old, old resume and file. Um, I think I just got, it was just sort of just like a, you know, timing thing. Uh, I knew, I knew the artists that were there, uh, Isaac Caniford, uh, who was responsible for a lot of the design work, for like Halo Reach, and I think a lot of like maybe some I think Halo Three War Two ODST. Uh, he he has like a very he's very sort of well known and famous for his um, uh, Halo aesthetics. He sort of like defined a lot of that stuff back in the day. So anyway, I was familiar with him. I was pinging him, um, uh, trying to ping the art director, and I was just sort of like working all the angles, and then um, also sending in you know just normal channels like applying through their website they were ramping up at the time because mm-hmm. because they were just getting started on destiny and so i was i was on some list you know they, they created some internal list of concept artists they were trying to hire and then they just kind of moved down the list and you know interview um several people and um, i was actually brought on for my industrial design kind of stuff like mm-hmm. hard surface things and then once I got working there, I ended up doing almost none of that and doing all environment work. Okay, crazy. Yeah, but um, anyway, it got, totally got my foot in the door and um, got a job there and you know, super stoked about it. Cool. So, in, in I, so when, you, when you look at your work, um, that's, that's one thing I mentioned, of course. So I studied industrial design myself, and I'm familiar with some of the practices and, and – um, and and techniques and stuff and it's cool to see some of that uh preserved you know i know it's like um you know as people leave 
their formal training, uh, their experiences kind of shape the work they produce and everything. And, and some people jettison that uh, pretty quickly and other people are able to uh, kind of take it and run with it. Um, it's cool. Do you, um, do you, did, uh, I guess, do you think much about that or, or is it, you know, did you, uh, I guess, how is your style or um, uh, what you've studied as far as industrial design goes, how has that uh, either stuck with you or changed over the course of your career? I would say it's definitely, um, you know, it's in there. Like it's definitely shaped me. Uh, like a lot of my education at school was traditional. Uh, we were all sort of switching to digital around fourth term, which is the halfway point um, through the education track there at Art Center. So like for, you know, for several terms, like I guess that's like a you know year or two, depending on how you break it up. It was just all markers. And if we did Photoshop, I mean, there are certain classes where we were um, encouraged to do Photoshop. But then sometimes if you did a Photoshop sketch, like you'd get in trouble, you know. So sure. Um, it was I guess it was very traditional. And, and from the industrial design standpoint, I was just um, always encouraged to do a lot of it. Like also at school, like one of the one of like the things that sort of I guess is in the. Um, I've just sort of been told while I was there is that to get really good at drawing, you either get really good at drawing form uh, through drawing cars or drawing the figure. And mm -hmm. so I was, I was just really into like the um, hard surface uh, cars, car stuff, car design and product design. I really wanted to be a car designer. Like when I first started school, when I was like a teenager and then that, I, I shifted tracks uh, about midway through my education. Okay, so what uh, kind of, so we're already into this a little bit, but I wanna, I'm gonna roll it back just a little bit and say like, okay, you, you went to Art Center. Um, what did you, what did you, so you started thinking that you were gonna go through the whole program and emerge an automotive designer and then work on actual cars that we see on the road today. Is that right? Yeah. So I, um, prior to art center, I went to a school in Seattle, the art Institute, which is by no means a prestigious, prestigious art school, but it did at the time have a Honda sponsored project. And so I was involved in this Honda project and that, uh, got me some connections with some, uh, Honda guys. And I was invited down to the, uh, their studio in Torrance and uh, a buddy of mine, and I from school, um, him and I flew down and we went to the, the Honda campus and we got to meet like one of the, I'm not sure if he was like a designer or a lead designer, I forget. Uh, and we were being introduced by like the head, uh, clay modeler. And those guys were just basically telling us that if we want, if we want to be designers at Honda, we should go spend some time at art center. And they encourage us to do that. And so since we sort of had these connections at Honda and uh, we're being told to check out Art Center, uh, we thought we'd do it. So I got a, we got both got a tour of Art Center um, that trip um, from the Honda guys. And then I also came back down um, pretty soon after for an Industrial Design Society of America conference. And so at that point, I was pretty much sold on Art Center. And it was just because it was such a prestigious design school for automotive design. And, uh, that is what definitely got me there. And then once I was there, I was sort of like introduced to like entertainment design and I kind of, uh, you know, got pulled into that. Okay. So that's interesting. Uh, were you at, so the school that you were going to before that you mentioned that was up in Seattle, mm -hmm. um, that had the Honda sponsored project that wasn't high school, was it? No, it's, a. Uh, um, you know, it's our, it's, uh, it's a school. It's a okay. college. Got it. Got it. I'm just trying to figure out the timeline here. So you actually started going there and then it was, you were there just for uh, two years. Two years. Okay. Okay. So you had, you already had, uh, some, you were already working on design stuff. Um, but then you really saw that you had to, in order to, um, really appeal to Honda or any, anyone else who might be recruiting, you wanted to come with, the credentials from that more prestigious school that may have 
uh, just a stronger program. Yeah. I mean, like in the, in the car design industry, um, you know, you have guys like, for example, like Chris Bangle, who was like a, you know, a design director at BMW who mm-hmm. came from, from art center. Um, you can sort of like go to art center, get your undergrad and move into these auto studios and, and work your way up the company. And when I was at art Institute in Seattle, we leave with um, associate's degrees in industrial design. And so that could have gotten, like, that was the whole point of that that uh, internship or sponsored project or whatever you call it. It was an opportunity to um, get a job as a, as a clay modeler at Honda. Okay. And so it was kind of like, we had gotten to the point where you could probably get a job as a clay modeler at Honda or an, at an auto studio. Maybe, you know, like if there's stuff available and you're good enough, but I was so interested in like being the designer that I I really was like, you know, I really wanted to continue education and keep moving on and and do whatever it took to sort of get that, that spot. So that's kind of why I was meeting those guys and uh, getting them involved in like the IDSA. Um, Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And were you actually, were, was this something that you were already interested in even before college? I mean, if you, if you started going to, to, um, you know, your post-secondary school, um, and working on an industrial design degree, um, I'm assuming you had some exposure before then. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my parents work at, have, they all worked at Boeing. My whole family worked at Boeing. Um, and so to them, they uh, were all, you know, sort of engineer types and yeah, that kind of thing. Totally. And uh, they, uh, to them, like industrial design was a thing. Like they knew industrial designers designed uh, aircraft interiors, for okay, example. Okay, cool. And so they're like, well, and also they're very, um, they're very like uniony kind of blue collar type. I get me with other, they're more white collar, but you know what I mean? It's like yes, yes. that whole, the whole union, uh, kind of corporate America thing to them. They're like, you should go to school, uh, you know, get it, get an undergrad in like design and then go get like an MBA and you could like, you know, move up in this, in a giant, you know, company. And so they were encouraging of me doing industrial design. Uh, if it was like at a giant car manufacturer, because to them, it's like you go work at Honda or GM or something. Sure. It's sort of, it's like working at Boeing. Yep. That know? makes sense. Totally. It's, it's, that's that same, there's probably a lot of, uh, parallels with the culture and everything. And, yeah. um, previously living in or near Seattle, I, you know, so many people, uh, family, friends and stuff, um, same experience as, as you described working at Boeing and then also, uh, going to school in Detroit, which, uh, at CCS kind of supplies a lot of the automotive, um, manufacturers yeah. out there, same type of thing. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, totally. So you, so, okay. So you had an idea that you wanted to do this. You, you got all the way to, um, to the decision of, of, or you arrived at the decision that you were going to then switch to Art Center. Was that a big undertaking? Was that, were there any roadblocks there or, or was it just as much as like making the decision and just committing? No. Yeah. It was just kind of crazy. Uh, cause, uh, the buddy of mine and I who were doing the Honda thing, we just got a U-Haul truck and loaded up all our stuff. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was pretty weird. Like looking back on it, like it was insane. And my parents thought we were crazy, um, but it worked out. So like, that's awesome. That's it could awesome. have very easily just been horrible. I could have like ended up on the streets of Los Angeles or something, but and eh, there's worse places to end up, I suppose. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So, so after a couple of years at uh, Art Center, was was that program? Because um, uh, the the automotive uh, students at CCS, um, their program was quite strict, and um, uh, well, strict isn't the right word. It was it was very demanding. Um, yeah, was, I assume it was just the same over there. Yeah, yeah, it's a very um, uh, rigorous program. I, I was sort of doing that stuff. I got in as a product student when mm-hmm. I got accepted, and my plan was to transition into uh, automotive design later on. And so right around the time when I was doing that, the entertainment curriculum was coming online. And that was uh, Scott Robertson, who's a, um, <clears throat> who's a well-known entertainment design guy who has, you know, published lots of books and worked on 
all sorts of like entertainment projects. And he uh, was kind of founding this entertainment track that he was going to be the department chair of. And so he was looking for portfolios of people who that could be in the inaugural class. And so me and I guess like 20 other people got accepted into this uh, inaugural entertainment class. And when I did that, I think I took some time off for that too. I took a break to just work on a portfolio. Like I, like I took a semester off or whatever from school, or I guess it's, a, they do three a year, but sure. So I took, I took like a summer off, worked on a portfolio um, for Scott's program, submitted it, got accepted. And then I switched into the entertainment program. Wow. Okay. So that's really cool. And that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't know that you were um, part of that. Uh, and of course, anyone who um, has gone through, you know, industrial design school or, or, or in entertainment, they, they'll know the name of, you know, Scott Robertson. And, um, uh, you know, it's, you know he's, he's just one of those uh, idols that so many people look up to. And um, that's, that's, I was, I was, curious as to kind of how and why you started to shift into entertainment. Um, uh, in my experience, there are not a lot of schools that offer super strong programs in both something like entertainment and industrial design. And I'd go so far as to say from observing from far away that Art Center um, seems to have uh, turned out a lot of uh, people who really understood the value of and took advantage of the the way industrial design um, can complement entertainment and vice versa. It, do you think that's a lot of, you know, is this, is this all just a product of Scott seeing kind of this opportunity and then making something of it? Or is, or is there more uh, of that going on at that school outside of his efforts? Oh, yeah, I think it's, it's in the culture there. I, I think what, what's going on or, or why it happened is because you had guys – like Scott, and in Scott's class, you had people like uh, Ryan Church and uh, like James Klein and Mark Gurner and and more, right? There's Got like just, okay. there's there's tons of these um, people who went to Art Center and they studied transportation design because there was no entertainment track, and so then they would supplement their uh, car design classes with illustration classes and sort of make their own entertainment track. Got and, it. And then they would go out in, in, in Hollywood's right there, like, you know, is in Los Angeles. So or Pasadena. So you can just go get a job working for a film studio right out of school. And so that's what a lot of those guys did. And I think Scott, you know, just, just saw that and he's like, well, I'll just create a curriculum, you know, kind of based on how all these other people and I, you know, did it. So he just basically decided to feed the industry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there was, it was crazy because like at the time when I was going to school, when I was switching, when I was like leaving car design classes, like, cause I was like being told on the car design side, like, yeah, you, you know, you've, you know, you, you can get into the program. It's not a big deal. Um, you know, by my instructors, like, you know, you're, you're doing great. You're doing better than the trans students and in, in my, you know, auto class. And so it was like, when I was transitioning to entertainment, I w it was kind of crazy. Uh, it was not perceived as like a um, the right decision. Sure. And it was like I would get teased about it. You know what I mean? Like uh, I'd be like I'd be like working on like my entertainment homework, and like the car guys would like make fun of me. Yeah. Because it was, it was not cool. And I think that that's kind of flipped there, from what I understand. Interesting. Yeah, that's very and, that's very interesting. There was no, um, there was no one doing it. I mean, like the, you know, that inaugural class, there mm -hmm. was like 20 of us and in the industry there, you could just leave school and there was just more work than you could ever do because at the time there was no one doing it. And whereas now it's completely at the opposite, right? Yeah, like, yeah absolutely. So it was very much just like, you know, right place, right time on, on, in that front. Um, I also, I mean, just the, it was just less competitive. So it was it was easier to sort of like get a start. That's really cool. So, um, was it one of those things that, um, I mean, you must've, you must've had something in you that, uh, was that piqued your interest beyond just the automotive stuff. If you, if you, um, saw this opportunity and then seized it, were you, were you kind of, you know, where did that come from? Is it, is it just, I was just, yeah, I was just kind of a, a game nerd. Okay. I thought it'd be cool to work in video games. Got it. Um, and then also, 
the perception was too at the time, like film is really cool. And if you're like, if you're like the best, then you go work in film. Sure. So, um, I tried doing that for a while and then, I mean, I went back and forth a bit, but I, I definitely feel way more at home, um, being a game developer and being in the gaming industry. I feel like it's super cool. I got to work on some movies, like not some great ones, but I did work on a couple and it was just kind of neat to just sort of scratch that itch and just be like, Oh cool. I did it. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then like move on. Um, cause yeah, it was just, it felt like at the time being an art center that the film was like where you go and that's what you do. And that's sort of like, you know, so again, it was kind of bizarre for me to like be leaving these jobs and going to go work on video games at the time. Mm, it was also sure. a bit weird, but yeah. So for somebody who hasn't experienced that, um, and I know there's, there's only so much, uh, you can share, but in your own words, how would you describe kind of generally, uh, or, or how would you compare the experiences of, of working in an environment that's for film versus for game development? Um, it's so I, the working in at image movers digital was the film studio I worked for, um, in house. And it was, it could be a bit more intense. There's way more deadlines, uh, or at least the deadlines come more often, right? In a game cycle, the deadlines are bigger. And whereas like, if you're working for a production designer, it's pretty tight. Um, but other than that, I think the other, another big thing that's different that I noticed is that if you work in a film studio, you can pretty much come in to work with like your hoodie up and like your buds in and not talk to anybody. And as long as the production designer is happy and you are getting your work done, like that's all that matters. Uh, whereas like video game development is way more hands on and it requires a lot more interaction and just sort of teamwork and, and working together on, on pro- problems, you know? So I'd say that's probably the biggest difference for me as, as on the independent, uh, or, you know, as like a, you know, just single contributor level. Sure. And has you, was your role similar in both scenarios? Like, were you, uh, asked to deliver the same type of stuff? Um, yeah, yeah. Concept art. Okay. Just stuff. It, it's, um, I think in film, it's a little, at least at that company, it's a little more broken down, right? I mean, if you have a script, once the script is locked, you know, there's only so many sets and so many props and so many characters and stuff like that. And then you just kind of work down a list. Whereas game development seems to be way more, everything is in flux. It's all a little more ambiguous. You can just change things up until the game ships or even after. I mean, you can just change it and, you know, deal like a day one, like push, you can push out content that like, you know, totally changes everything. So it's way more, uh, I guess just sort of like always moving, always evolving. It, It was like when I first started working at Bungie, we would like, you know, work on something and then we think it's good. And then we would play it again like a year later and it wasn't quite working. So then they would redo it or based on feedback from like a director that they would change things. So it's just way more evolving and sort of, I guess the word would be just polishing, right? You're just kind of like working at, look, working slowly towards the solution as opposed to just kind of like working down a list. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. Um, so now, since we're talking a little bit about um, film and games, kind of uh, in broad terms, um, as far as you've been in the industry, you've probably seen a few things, uh, trends come and go as far as you mentioned earlier, things like demand um, and supply and, and stuff like that. Um, where What would you say if you, know, if you were to talk about um, the state of opportunity for people who are not yet in the industry, but are, are, are trying to leave school with a, a similar, um, skill set that you might have. They want to do concept work. They're not sure if, uh, film or games is, is right for them. Um, can you offer any insight into that as far as, um, maybe just advice or general observations you might have? Yeah, I think it's important to try to have like a really clear vision or goal of what you want to do. Um, I think it's, I think the tendency is, and I, and I, I think that education's sort of, they build this into the uh, curriculum to have a portfolio that's like really well rounded and to be able to do like, you know, some of it, sometimes it's like, you'll see portfolios with like animation work and then 
you know, photo bashing kind of photo reel, uh, like what movie look would have, and then you'll have more video game type stuff. And so it's that, it's that balance where you want to have, you need to have a portfolio that's like broad like and covers a big spectrum so you can actually get work. But at the same time, I feel like it's probably easier to sort of like focus a little more on what you really want to do. And then, you know, I think the jobs will come easier. You know what I mean? As opposed to like having this shotgun approach, being a little more narrowed and focused on what, what it is you want to do. So if you want to go work at, if you want to do video games and you want to work at Naughty Dog, then, you know, you make a portfolio that looks like it would fit there. You look at the artists that work there, you look at the games that they make and you say, okay, and he's going to be a little more photo real. It's going to be based real world. Um, and just kind of like hone in on that. If you want to work at Bungie, then obviously you check out destiny and you see what you know they're doing and kind of maybe you tailor a portfolio to that. Whereas if you want to work on transformers, then you're going to have a very different portfolio. Sure. Uh, you know. <clears throat> that makes sense. So, but th- it's tough. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. And it sounds like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm um, sure there's m- no one right answer, but it sounds like there's a number of approaches. Um, maybe being a generalist was a little more rece- better received, or maybe you had more opportunities a number of years ago, but um, it seems like there is more competition and a lot more people um, out there who are applying or, or trying to get those jobs. Um, yeah. one of my old roommates, um, who worked in a production environment, uh, at a VFX house, um, had mentioned that like, um, just being somebody who generally specialized in something, um, you know, if you're, if you're the person who just does, I don't know, simulations or something like that for VFX or something, um, fluid stuff or whatever, like, and you just have that strong portfolio, um, it's a lot easier for somebody to kind of pinpoint you and be like, Oh, he's the guy for this or whatever. Yeah. You definitely like you fit in the production. You have a spot. Um, another thing I would say too, that I've done in the past, I, I still do it to this day is I, is I, I have a lot of work and I've worked on like tons of stuff, especially back when I was in California. I mean, I've, I've worked on like Dora, the Explorer theme park stuff. Okay. Like I've just worked, I've worked on like horrible stuff, right. Got like it. from based on like my, my normal portfolio, but I would like never show that ever, mm-hmm. you know you know what I mean? Because you and don't or, want that more, you don't want to draw more of that work, I would assume. I don't want to draw that kind of work. I just, yeah, it, it also, it just dilutes the brand. Got it. So like everything that I put on Instagram and Tumblr and on my website is all very like uh, intentional and crafted. And I do have a more, I have like a much broader portfolio. Like when I was back in the Bay Area, too, I was doing like a lot of theme, you know, a lot of theme park work. And I, I essentially have like a whole theme park portfolio, but wow. I would just not, I just wouldn't, it's just not, it's not what I want. You know, it just it doesn't fit the brand, I guess. Yeah. It's just, I don't want it online. Um, if it is online, I try to get it offline. I do keep it and I do share it occasionally to like, if I, if I need that kind of work or if I'm looking for that kind of work, but it's just, yeah, it's not. I just, I think that's like a good, I, I tell people that, that it doesn't hurt to have that kind of stuff, but I just say that like, keep it separated. Like if you, like, again, like if you want to go, I wouldn't show that work. If I wanted to get a job at Naughty Dog or at Bungie, but I, I might have like a very sci-fi sort of section of my portfolio that I would show to a certain company and maybe a real world section I would show to another company. Sure. Um, but I'm not going to probably show them both. Even if I was interviewing there, I'd be really cautious of doing that. Okay, I got that. That makes sense. But that's uh, tough because I mean, it takes it takes time. I know, even as students, it takes a ton of time to make that kind of work. Sure. But it's probably worth it. I mean, yeah, it's it, it's, it's the same. It's the same thing too with like honestly, like any creative field. Like I, I know that we were told that back in school too. Like if you're if you end up being a car designer, mm-hmm. and then you want to like switch from doing exteriors to interiors or something, right. Or switch companies is so much harder. You essentially have to take time off and like rebuild your portfolio. Right. So anyway, it's just, it's tricky because if you, if you have a certain portfolio, uh, once you get going, once you get going, like, let's say you can get a job, you get your foot in the door in the industry and you're working in mobile games mm-hmm. and you're like, wow, I really don't like working in mobile games, but it pays the bills. So then it's like, well, then you got to like create 
a portfolio of like the company you want. If you're going to go work at Riot, then you work in your Riot portfolio, you know, on the side. And then when you pr- pr- present it to them, you don't show them your mobile games work. Right. That makes sense. Um, so with uh, concept art, um, uh, not not to argue semantics too much, but um, do you distinguish between the terms uh, concept art and uh, concept design, or does your title more come from your actual uh, professional position and title? Yeah, I just kind of go with the flow on that one. Okay. Um, I feel like a lot of the work is concept design or it is way more design oriented, but you know, it's just like these, all these positions have just kind of had this name for a while. Sure. That's just, that's what they are. That makes sense. But no, I, I would, I consider myself more of a designer. I mean, I'm not, it's just, I, artist is kind of a weird name in the first place, but it is, it's pretty, yeah, exactly. And, um, but I mean, it can be it can be I guess helpful a little bit for people to kind of understand uh, those buckets. Um, uh, in a lot of cases, they are used interchangeably. But you know, it's it in your case, if you're coming up with original ideas, or you know, you're not just essentially an illustrator. I guess an illustrator is a little bit closer to a design, um, an artist, uh, concept art, whatever. But yeah, and I, well, in film, they they'd call you an illustrator. Okay, got it. Cool. So. I mean, I've seen and enjoyed your um, work on Instagram for quite a while. Um, and and I'll, for Thank anyone you. who, of course, yeah. Uh, for anyone who hasn't seen that, there's there's a lot of um, stuff that uh, doesn't make it onto your professional uh, website portfolio, like your commercial work. So um, if I were to describe them, I'd, I'd say lots of um, kind of gray grayscale sketches lots of mechanical stuff hard surface uh mechs robots interiors ships things um how would you describe the that your actual kind of design language and the style that you've you've um developed over the years i don't know i kind of liked your description in the in the intro it was like <laughs> like, like retro futurism or something like that um i I think that stuff, like the sketching style, it's just sort of, it is definitely inspired um, by some of the old school stuff out there. It's just kind of what I like to do for fun. Um, yeah, I'm pulling it up. I, yeah, it's it's tough. I think it's just sort of, it's sort of, it's partly default, like maybe my default form language. And it's also really inspired by just like, you know, old school, like Star Wars books, like Joe Johnston and like Ralph McQuarrie and that kind of stuff. Um, I do a lot of, I do a lot of that stuff just for, for, you know, for fun and it, it could, it's quick. I don't have tons of free time. So I try to just, um, usually I'll like have sketches lying around either like in you know, a sketchbook or, um, post-it notes and occasionally they make it into the computer and I like finish them up a little bit or I'll do some dedicated thing and record it and try to put it online. Um, but yeah, it's just all, it's kind of, it, it gets done because this is all kind of like bite sizable pieces of concept art. I can't, I don't have time to like sit down and do like a full on illustration. Got it. So was that, kind of what, was that the inspiration behind uh, bacon's bites? The name? Uh, no, not really. Just coincidental. <laughs> yeah, no, that was like just the name I was using like for a, um, a Tumblr that I had back when we were in California and I would just like post pictures on for like friends and family. Oh, okay. And then I just sort of, I ended up like, you know, it's just so hard to get like, um, usernames. Mm, yep. And I just didn't have like, there actually is more Darren Bacons, which is weird. And, uh, they all get their usernames first before me. And so I was yep. like, I'll just grab, I'll, I'll grab that one. I fought with that my whole life. I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah, that's okay. That's cool. So the, the work on, on the Instagram, um, what I love about them is, 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 you know, what you mentioned kind of, um, you know, some of them are a lot looser than others. Um, but I just, I, I love how, um, how graphic the nature of, of your sketches, your ink work, your marker work. I love that. Um, I think it's something, I mean, is that, do you spend a lot of time considering that when you're, when you're coming up with designs and when you're putting pen to paper? Yeah. And it's sort of also, um, ongoing uh, and 
or I, I guess I'm, I'm responding to feedback. So one thing I'm really interested in, and I talk about this a lot with um, uh, Nick Sparth, is uh, sort of designing artwork for social media. Okay, got, so, it. got it. So like, I don't do this all the time, but sometimes I specifically will do a sketch and I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to like decipher a formula for what is popular online. So sometimes it's like, I've noticed like if you have, if you add color, it's like, it's more popular. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm just sort of like, I'm definitely trying to do things that are punchy and contrasty and that read on cell phones. Sure. Especially, especially small. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of like, I'm trying to figure that out. I find it very, I find it fascinating. I think that, um, you, it's also, it also happens on Tumblr too. Like there's also certain like aspect ratios on Tumblr, yeah. which are more popular than others. And it just makes sense because the way the Tumblr feed is laid out, if you do like a, a, a vertical format, there's just more screen real estate. Totally. Totally. You know, it's also a kind of thing of like, like why Snapchat is interesting Hmm. that that vertical format um, video it just gives us like unique sort of almost like ar like look into like what someone's looking at yeah it's just it's just different than we're just so you know used to seeing things horizontal and so anyway i just think the aspect ratio has a lot to do with it and i am when i am posting sketches i am sort of thinking about that kind of stuff okay cool i mean it 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 definitely comes across like when I'm, when I'm looking at it, just at a quick glance, that's, that's one thing that stands out is, is it, it does read well at scale, as you mentioned, by doing that high contrast kind of blocking in, um, interesting forms. So just at a glance, whether it's real, uh, tight or not, it still reads well. Um, that's, that's really cool. Um, so with those, with all these sketches and stuff that you, um, that you're posting. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, uh, vehicles and, and, and stuff like that. Do you have any, when you sit down, you've got a blank page in front of you. Um, do you kind of only pick up a blank or I'm sorry, do you only pick up a notebook when you've got an idea that you want to sketch out or, um, do you ever sit down going like, I'm going to draw, but I don't know what I'm going to draw. Um, I do, I do both, but I, I find that if I have a idea in, in my mind it's way yeah, obviously it's way easier so sometimes i won't draw until i have that sort of like fuzzy vision and then when i do it's just way more easier and it just kind of like becomes this you know sort of journey to kind of get it out and, and try to and i'll redraw it several times to you know what i mean to try to like get that sort of impression in my mind out or the concept out okay and but yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I used to, there is like, um, there was this class I took that, um, Nick Pugh taught at school, which was really interesting called originality and design. And the, at one point we, uh, did, I forget how many hundreds of pages we did, but it's just like hundreds of pages of scribbles to try to like get your default, um, you know, muscle movement, muscle patterns out. And then we like filled up like a giant hanger with them and it was really interesting. And then you try to like pull something out of those scribbles that's original. Um, so I do do that sometimes, but it's pretty rare and it's, um, you know, it takes a lot of like, sort of, definitely takes a lot more effort. I think for me to sort of like try to find meaning in like my scribbles than it does. It just kind of like have a really clear vision and just try to execute it as close as possible. But it's just like, you know, sometimes I just don't have the idea or I just don't have like the mental, you know, capacity to do that. So I'll just kind of start scribbling something out and see if I can kind of find some cool forms in there. Okay. That's cool. Um, you mentioned, uh, a hanger. Are you talking like actually laid all the pages out in like a, a physical hanger or like a, uh, yeah, it's a, like a large it space. Used, yeah. It's a really large space. I think it used to be a wind tunnel. Oh, actually. crazy. Okay, cool. I, I bet. Believe it or not, I've been in one, so I know exactly what that looks like. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a big empty space. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Very cool. So, with the with the design work um, that you do on paper and that you post on, say, you know, uh, Instagram or or something like that, um, y you know, you're you're really strong in both the traditional media, 
Um, but it seems like you translate that very well into digital. Um, is that, um, is that something that, um, that you have to, do you find that it took a while to be able to do that? Um, or, or, or ha ha has, has the medium not really been so important to you over the years? Um, well, I just think that in, it's way easier to do something sort of tight and resolved in digital. Um, so, but it's also harder for me. I just work on a, I guess this is an Intuos 4 or something. I, I work on like an old um, Wacom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never made the switch to the uh, Cintiqs. Right. So it's easier for me to kind of sketch out an idea and sort of like, you know, get my thoughts out usually on paper and then um, to do sort of like a high res pass in, in the computer. Uh, that's not always the case. Um, but I think if I want to do line work, that's usually like the, my go-to solution. Um, I do some kind of IDA in thumbnail digitally too. And I, actually at work, I probably do more, I do it all digital just cause it's easier than actually having to draw it and then take a picture of it and scan it. It's pretty rare. I do that in like my day job. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it's just a little more fun and like nostalgic for me to kind of sit down and draw something, you know? Sure. Sure. Get dirty. Where are, are you using, um, as far as, uh, when you're doing the digital work at, 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 at your job, um, are, is that primarily in Photoshop or are you using other applications as well? Yeah, I just use Photoshop. I mean, I, I'll use, um, Moto too for doing like 3d stuff, but I more and more like I, I've, I go in and out of like, uh, well, I was for a long time. I was getting really into 3d. Um, I, in fact, I was doing a lot of it at Bungie too. And then at a certain point, um, I just kind of find that I can be more successful quicker, like a lot quicker, right? Yeah. If I just do it just 2D. And I, I struggle going back and forth with like wanting to have this like crazy, super tight nail image, which then I would want to rely on like 3D and like bump maps and, mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff. Just go crazy. I go crazy, but it just takes so much time. So I end up just kind of working um, – you know, digit, like just 2d in Photoshop these days. I just don't have, I just don't have tons of time to mess around and make some crazy 3d thing. I also like, I was getting into VR a bit about a year ago, like VR sketching and all that stuff. And it's kind of the same thing. It's like, it's really exciting. I really love the potential there. And I really love the potential of like 3d. And I wish I had the time to sit down and like build a crazy 3d model, but it's just, I have so such little time that I just, I just find it's way easier to like get the ideas out the, just like the simple, stupid old fashioned way with just like a pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of why I just default back to that all the time. Well, that makes sense. And I remember when I saw one of the, um, earlier sketches that you had created in, in VR, um, do you want to at least, I mean, I know you, you said you were getting into it. So it sounds like you haven't done it much lately, but would you mind at least sharing for some people, um, a little bit about, the process of that and then kind of the experience in general, because I think a lot of people were pretty surprised or impressed by that. Um, and a lot of people have still not gotten to experience what that's like. So do you mind sharing a little bit? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was really excited about it and I still am. I still think it's awesome. I do think it's the future. Um, I expect us to be doing that a lot. Uh, I went out and got a, a Vive, a HTC Vive, like, the day or the day after they came out, it was really, or maybe it was the first week. It was really soon. I was just like, as soon as I could, I went down and bought one and, um, <clears throat> started experimenting with it. They, you're, you're just basically drawing in 3d space or painting in 3d space. Uh, when the vibe came out, all that was available was a Google app called tilt brush and tilt brush just lets you kind of draw or paint with these ribbons of polygons. Mm hmm. And it's really simple. I mean, I sort of, um, it feels to me, it's like my analogy. It's like, it's like Photoshop, you know, like 20 years ago, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely like, I see that the future's in there. There's something in there. We're just looking at like a really, really, really early version of it. Um, several months later, uh, Oculus shipped a medium and now they're shipping quill, which is, um, 
Medium is more of a modeling software. You sort of like, say for example, you have a brush that's the volume of a cube, and then you can extrude that, and then you get like a rectangle cube cool. or whatever whatever you move the brush. <clears throat> and then Quill is um, Oculus's version. Essentially, I haven't tried it yet, but it's from what I understand, it's similar to Tilt Brush in that you're painting with brush strokes. But I'm not sure if they're handling it technically the same way as the Tilt Brush models. Okay. Yeah, when I look back, it's like I see one of the I think one of the earlier things I saw uh, that you had posted from Tilt Brush. Um, it kind of looks very wireframey, very almost like it's built out of shreds of paper. Those kind of like the ribbons that you mentioned. Um, and then uh, I see something a little bit later that has kind of like a snowmobile like proportions, but kind of like tank treads going on. And that's the Oculus uh, medium. Yeah. And there's just so much more heft and detail and believability to that. Uh, it's kind of cool to see those kind of leaps and bounds and, and uh, be very interested to see what what's next with um, Quill, like you mentioned. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting because when you use tilt brush it does feel like it does really feel like you're drawing mm -hmm. you, like you're using that part of your brain whatever that is and then when you're 3d modeling you're you're also like it's, i'm using the same sort of like thought process i would if i was modeling in moto or i guess it's probably more similar to like zbrush but but still it's definitely modeling and you don't really it's just not quite the same they're very different kind of the 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 sculpting and uh, additive versus subtractive as opposed to just um yeah the other thing that's really tricky i, I think i'm not sure if they fixed this yet they've been they do tons of updates all the time but um you can kind of like yeah you can like subtract shapes using a brush in in a medium and tilt brush you kind of have to just nail it or i'm not sure if they've allowed you to erase part of the line yet oh so just like an undo or whatever yeah, so it's kind of a bummer. Like when I was using it, if you wanted to like draw a line and then erase half of it, you had to just delete it uh, and then dr draw your line again. <clears throat> so did as far as getting the um, the actual uh, what do you call it geometry out of something like Tilt Brush? Was there enough, were were there extra processes involved in that, or did it just export a, a file format? No, they have they, they give you like a, a OBJ or a FBX. Oh, I okay, oh. got it. It's pretty straightforward. The models are just heavy, but so just a, a mesh after that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Cool. And then as far as um, d does in your experience, was it would you call it necessarily faster or slower? Um, because again, like in, in one of the mechs you did in the tank bike, it's like there's a fair amount of detail in there. It may not be all like, you know, look like it was milled by a machine, but like there's a lot going on there. Um, is it is yeah. that any faster or slower than than modeling or drawing? Well, Oculus uh, Medium, that uses a lot of uh, shapes, kind of presets. Okay. okay. So you can kind of like use their little kit and make something pretty quick. So a lot of those pieces in the tank bike one are, are one of their default kind of brushes. I imagine the goal, if they haven't already, is to have, be able to make your own, right? And kind of assemble your own little kits. Interesting. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how that works. I think drawing with like, say with like a um, tilt brush, you, you, it's really a cool way to draw because you can kind of get your, it's easier to sort of get some of those ideas out. Like sometimes I'll struggle on paper trying to draw something I'm sort of imagining and it's just not quite coming out right, you know? And in, when I notice that I'm in VR, it does come out easier. Okay. It sort of flows out easier because you can think in 3D space or just standing there with it all around you. It's just way easier to sort of visualize it in 3D. So it does have its benefits. And it definitely has a spot in, it, in the pipeline. Uh, we've we've used um, Tilt Brush at work, so you know, work on the next Halo game and uh, designing some characters. We um, were actually using it to sort of sketch out and then view in VR. So it it is usable. I mean, that's not. It's by no means a final model. We 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 sort of like go back. We were going back and forth sketching a two D and then sketching in uh, tilt brush and then ultimately we kind of use that tilt brush file to kick out that 
that FBX or OBJ or whatever to the, the character team. And then they were able to sort of build their mass out based on our file. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's a neat way to kind of visualize your sketch. So, I mean, even, even just, I think in a production pipeline, it has this, it probably has a spot early on sketching and ideating. And then again, I'm sure as a model viewer, would be amazing as well. I mean, to sort of review assets right. in VR would be incredible. That's really cool. Um, I've only had the limited experience of of Tilt Brush, as was mentioned earlier, and um, like I've I've literally drawn like a thing once with Tilt Brush, and it was very cool. But um, to see what you got out of it, um, even a while ago, is is pretty cool. I can't wait to see kind of what's next, the next iteration of that. Um, so that's really cool. So. It's fun on on this topic with with um, you know as we're kind of still touching a little bit on um, things like sketching and and coming up with early stage concepts uh, and then analog versus digital and all that uh, somebody like myself who I don't even know if there's fixing this but like I get this thing where like almost every year it's like okay this is the year I'm gonna enjoy sketching again <laughs> or get back into yeah. it or something like that like because. For whatever reason, I just it was it was very stubborn and just never got super comfortable with putting pen to paper. It just always felt like there was um, kind of something in the way, or just uh, got hung up in making things either too tight or or whatever. Um, I'd I'd like to believe I'm not the only person out there who's felt that. Do you to someone or ask somebody who looks like they're they've they're well 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 beyond that? Do you have any advice for anyone who's who's trying to kind of just get comfortable with getting those ideas out and 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 working up to the level of, of some of the design sketches that, that you produce? Uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's mileage, right? I mean, that's what it is. That is what it is. And so it's tough, right? Cause it, yeah, I know what you mean. I feel like that too. I, I sketch a lot of times, a lot of the time and I don't like it. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, got it. I, I post this, a small percentage of like what I'm drawing. Um, so yeah, I just think we, it's just sort of like this ongoing battle or this, you know, constant struggle. I, I, I work with, um, people that keep really, um, dedicated, um, sketchbooks like Daniel Chavez, for example, he's just like amazing. Um, he has these amazing sketchbooks and he's sketching all the time and it's like so impressive because he's like so dedicated and he just keeps sketching, keeps sketching. I'm not that dedicated. I'm more like, I, I sketch as an outlet and I do it sort of, maybe it's almost just, it's not like, I guess it's not quite therapeutic, but it's like, it's definitely like I, I sort of feel like I need to do it. It's like definitely I'm driven to do it. And so I, I kind of do it whenever I can, but I'm not doing it in like a super dedicated way. However, I would say that like in school, I mean, there, you know what I mean? Like all in education, it's just, that was sort of like all I did. And so it was just forced upon me to do, you know, tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of drawings. And then at a certain point, it just sort of like becomes this like mechanism thing I do to sort of like, you know, have fun, which is weird. So that makes sense, though. I mean, I think yeah. I think that that, you know, um, is simple as it is. I think sometimes we have to just, you know, hear that and, and acknowledge that. Um, that's how anyone gets good at anything is just doing it more and more and more. Um, yeah. I, and honestly, it's, it's weird too. Like I think about this a lot, like just, um, with people or like what drives people or motivation to do certain things. And I think with my, with my case and like, I think people like people I know that sort of are like this too. And, and probably like you, it's just like, you just sort of it's a thing that you've always sort of been compelled to do. And so you just do it. And then, you know, decades go by and then you're, you know, you're pretty good at it. You sure. Know? But, that makes sense. And then, and that's kind of, yeah, that's, and then there's, there is certain people. I, I mean, I do, there, I've met people who are like a phenomenal and it's funny because, um, I've just noticed that there isn't really any shortcuts. Like, yes, some people, like will be like really young and super amazing, but then I'll find out, Oh, they've, they've been doing, you know, they've had to like 
years of like training or they, you know what I mean? Like they've just been, they had their mileage was built up in some way yes. at, a, at a young age. You know what I mean? There is just, it's like, there's no shortcuts. Sure. Yeah. You know, Cause we're all, we're all just kind of human. We're all sort of, you know, basically uh, operating with the same sort of like starting point. So it's like that mileage just ends up being really important. And, and I also too, I think maybe perseverance, like as you, as you get older and then if you stick with it versus like, just be like, ah, oh, forget it. This is hard. Sure. Or, I'm, you know what I mean? And if those people like stay with it. Then by the time they're like 40, 50, 60, then they're just phenomenal. Yep. You know, are there, are there points in your, um, career or things that, that you've done, whether it was personal choice or for work where it felt like that, where it was just, uh, it was a challenge, but through sticking with it, it became something, it turned into something good. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we all sort of have existential art crises and are trying to figure out like, you know, what it is that, you know, we're, we're trying to do. And I, I think, um, I struggled too with that. And for me, it just, I, I just kind of just go back to just doing what I think is fun and like what I want to do. I think when I tried to do stuff that isn't me, you know, mm -hmm. like, or isn't, isn't my voice, then it just, it just kind of is fake and not as good. Got it. So, I mean, my art is just what it is, like, especially like my Instagram, right? Like where I'm posting sketches and stuff. Like it just is that just cause that's kind of just, I'm just that kind of was what I like to draw, you know? And I could probably, like I was you know, talking about earlier, like I could try to tune it and maybe <clears throat> work in some weird scientific way to try to like get more likes or something or, or you know what I mean? Or des design an Instagram feed that is like highly popular, but <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kind of like, uh, I'm just trying to like do what I can to, um, produce art that like, uh, that makes me happy and that I'm proud of. And you know what I mean? So I, I, and another thing, uh, one thing that I was told, um, this is kind of a funny side story I can go into is, um, when I started at image movers digital working, um, for Doug Chang, the production designer, mm -hmm. I was, I wasn't very good. Like I was just kind of like, you know, I worked a few jobs and I was kind of right out of school ish. And, um, when he had me start, he started by just putting me awkwardly behind other artists who were really good. <laughs> <clears throat> and then it was just like, he's like, just watch. So, um, one guy was Brian Flora, who's like this phenomenal matte painter. And, uh, he worked at ILM. He's worked on tons of movies. He's just like amazing. And so it was so awkward. Cause like, I would just sit there behind him and like watch him work. And then like after a while he'd be like, okay, take the file. And he'd be like, okay, Darren, take the file. I'll put it in the Dropbox. You go back to your computer and you mask everything out and then bring it back to me and I'll paint it. And it was, it was like this, like, you know, this really weird back and forth he was trying to teach me. But one of the things that he told me when I was like, you know, what's your secret? And he was just like, just make it look beautiful. Like whatever that means to you. And so it just that's what gets back to sort of that existential art crisis thing where you just have to figure out what it is you like and you know it, whether it's an image or a design like if you think it looks good then it's going to look good you know to you right and then hopefully after you do that for a while it'll look good to other people too and obviously there's like some rules and you know formulas but um, basically that that stuck with me just make it look beautiful um, to me and so I just kind of like try to do things that you know, I've, I, that's kind of how I operate, I guess now. That's cool. And it sounds like it's, it's kind of gets at a, um, the core of, of being genuine, I guess, and, and not, uh, trying to, you know, um, be something yeah. that you're not, not trying to turn something into, like you said, not being, um, necessarily driven by, uh, looking around you and seeing what, what's working for other people or, or, or being just responsive to trends and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, totally. Right. You could, you could just look at like art station or something, right. Or CG hub previously or yeah. Tumblr. You can like, you could craft a portfolio just based on like what's trending. And then you'd be, you'd have a popular portfolio probably, and maybe you'd get work, but I don't, I don't know how long I could do that. How, how long do you think it is before they, um, build bots that just do that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Seriously, I mean, probably. You, you probably could do that. And, um, you know, and yeah, pretty soon, maybe, maybe sure. any, any programmers out there who really know their stuff, they make go make that bot and then wait till you get a job, your bot gets a job offer and then tell them what's, what's up on the table. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, Google's working on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's crazy. Um, well, cool. So when when it comes to working with um, the 2D stuff, when you're when you're sketching out ideas and and um, you know, just doodling. Um, do you have certain tools that you like to use a lot? Like I've seen some, you know, I see some, you know, some Copic or Copic markers and, um, and, and some stuff like that. Do you have anything that you, that are your favorite that you like to return to? Oh no, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not very picky. I, um, just like a ballpoint pen. Um, I have some good ones that I think Scott Robertson uses. I forget the brand. I could send you the link. Um, but I actually got really used to just using like those, those cheap Bic mm -hmm. ball, ballpoint pens on copy paper. Like that's probably the majority of, in my life, I've probably drawn more on that stuff than anything else. Yep. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. But yeah, no, I, I do like the, I like the markers. Um, I like the dr sketch and ballpoint pen and that's kind of my jam. If I can, if I can do that, that's, that's a happy place. Cool. Cool. So, I, in, in, in looking around to see if there is any, um, you know, when I was looking around online, I actually just recently came across your YouTube channel. Uh, that is the one that's uh, branded, uh, uh, concept department. Um, so can you, uh, I mean, the, other than, um, me saying there's some really cool stuff on there that I got really sucked into watching, um, how would you summarize that to, to anyone who's listening? Um, concept department, I was wanting to share stuff and I didn't, I was just looking for like, um, you know, like a forum to do that. And YouTube seemed like a really good spot just cause it's a little more vast of a community than like Vimeo and maybe just a little deeper and like commenting and stuff. Um, I know like I, I just came across, I just wanted to just have a place to share my work. Uh, like the original motivator was when I was a student, I was going to these design salons <clears throat> that this instructor was putting on. And that was probably like one of the most important things in my education. And it was just like, the, it was all it was, was just an opportunity to like talk about art and like watch demos and like, that sort of thing. And so I was kind of at the time I was just thinking like, I wish I could do that somehow, but I don't have time. And I was like, well, maybe I'll just record demos and put them on YouTube. And that was just kind of the motivation. It was just trying to kind of help people. Uh, Cause I would get, you know, asked, you know, regularly, like how do you do this or what, what software do you use or how do you, you know, what's your process? And so I was like, I'll just start posting stuff. I don't. And unfortunately, like I also get asked to like do more, like in my, my commercial work is more environment related and sure. You know, that kind of thing. I, I just don't have time to sort of go through all that. Otherwise I would, and I'm sure I will someday, but it ends up kind of being just sort of like sketches because that's sort of like what I can do. I mean, I have, I have one recorded right now. It's just on my hard drive and I haven't just, I haven't edited it together just cause I haven't had time. Okay. okay. So, I mean, like I wish I could do more. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's I, I think that's fairly common. I mean, all of us. It's uh, I say all of us. I mean, uh, anyone who's kind of in in the creative um, field, you know, it's like it, whether or not you're lucky enough to be doing that stuff for work or just as a hobby. Um, you know, whether it's learning uh, new tools, um, you know, new software or whatever, uh, building a new body of work, or then you know, sharing. It's like yes, there, there's just never enough time in the day. Um, but something that really stood out when I looked at a couple of these videos is um, you, this is not just like a time lapse of you sketching and then, um, you know, some crazy music in the background. Like um, there's some really quality uh, narrative and explanation of what you're doing. And um, some of them are a little bit get more deep into the kind of the whys and hows behind design, whereas some of them are just uh, maybe a little simpler, not not quite so in depth. but um, you know, I just want to bring that up for anyone who's listening. So they're aware, uh, there's a lot to be learned, I think on, on what you've already produced and put up there. So nice job with that. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I think, um, that was one of the things too, is like, I noticed online is that there just isn't a lot of talk about good design. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
I don't, it's design is really, it's weird. Cause it's like, you know, design 101 is like so important, but most of us and myself included, it's so easy to just kind of like forget that sometimes and just worry about some cool software or some cool technique and just kind of skip all that. And so, um, I was making that stuff too. I mean, partially as a reminder to myself, but also anyone else out there that wants to learn that, um, yeah, just kind of like design can go pretty deep and that if we spend a little more time on design, you know, our stuff is going to be that much more believable, you know, cause like real world objects are beautiful and gorgeous. I mean, like a Ferrari looks, you know, it's, it looks beautiful to the eye because someone is like carefully and painstakingly gone over every surface of that car. You know what I mean? Absolutely. For like thousands of hours. And then when you like, then someone comes along and says, I'm going to design a video game car. And then it's like, they spend an afternoon on it. And of course it's not going to look the same, you know, or the design will just be like very not thoughtful. So I'm, I'm very interested in like, how do you, um, bring real world design principles, you know, in, into the entertainment industry. I mean, it's the same is true. Even if you look at like movie cars, like, it's just like, I, I can't, I don't think I've ever seen a movie car. I've been like, Oh well, yeah, I could, I believe that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause it's just, they're never, they're always just so rushed and it makes sense. I get it, but it's just not the same. Sure. And, uh, obviously I think I, would you say this is right that your awareness, um, for this and kind of the respect for a good design comes from, um, your education path going through industrial design classes, things like that. Oh yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm totally just like kind of, yeah, I'm, re I'm really into it. I mean, it's not just true of like video games and stuff. I'm, even if I'm driving around on the road, I'm still like hypercritical of design. And I, if I see things that are annoying, it's like, I'll take a picture of it, and like paint over it or something. And just like, ah, oh, it's, it's almost there. You know what I mean? But that line doesn't flow just quite right. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, I just being a nerd is kind of, is kind of my excuse. So for somebody who's looking to improve their work, maybe they maybe they've um, kind of become aware of of concept design or concept art through the internet. Uh, they've got this idea that it's um, you know you got to be able to make stuff look good, you got to make it look believable, you got to make it um, you know uh, sexy or eye catching or something like that, and you got to get people interested in it. Um, what, what advice can you offer to that person who maybe has, hasn't uh, taken advantage of, of understanding design uh, and kind of what, what can you give them to, 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 to kind of get into that and, and, and then have them translate that into their work? I think it's like um, finding your own aesthetic and figuring out what it is you like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, just getting to know yourself thing again. Um, and then collecting reference, I think too, like, um, reference is just super important for me. It's for just, it's important for everyone. Um, nowadays it's so easy because of the internet to just keep and store reference. You know, even back in the day, it was like you had to store giant folders on hard drives and, and it was like, whoever had the best reference won. you know, or even before that, like, um, I met a guy once that had just a giant, um, bookshelf full of like photographs he'd taken all over the world wow. and. And it was just like, you know, cause before the internet, like that was, that was, that was his livelihood, you know, and have this collection of reference you could draw on for inspiration. Yep. And so I think like reference is super important and we're very fortunate to have, um, so many tools now on the internet, like to, to sort of like sort and collect these sort of things. And then it's like, after a while you just sort of figure out like what it is you like and then it just naturally works its way into your work if you study it, you know? Okay. Yeah. I feel like I, I, I was more or less exposed to that, uh, idea of, of visual design library or reference through, I think videos probably created by Scott Robertson and, uh, Fang Zhu. Uh, I know is real big on that. Um, mm -hmm. and I remember seeing kind of these, these, you know, crazy file structure, like you said, of just so many digital images. Uh, yeah. Now we have, Pinterest. Do you, do you use that tool at all for this or? Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have Pinterest. Um, I've, I used it a lot. Okay. Cool. So, I mean, I, I I'll kind of collect and store stuff there. I used to use Tumblr and then I kind of got away from it just cause it wasn't as easy to sort it. Right. Um, and then before that I used to have, 
you know, obviously those crazy file structures and like hard drives, but, um, I've just gotten away from that cause it's just so cumbersome to use mm-hmm. and it's more, more times. So it's like, I'll use stuff for like, um, inspiration on like form and stuff. But if I'm trying to do a sketch, I'm usually looking at like some rendering style. Um, or another thing I'll do, like when I'm working on a painting, like I'm working on a painting right now at work and, uh, it looks good, but it's not like great. And I, there's just more I can do. And so I have like other artists paintings open and I'm like trying to get it there. You know what I mean? And I don't think I'm going to, cause it's Craig Mullins, but it's just still <laughs> like, I'm like, you know what I mean? Like I'm looking at inspiration and I'm like, wow, this guy, this is like, this painting is really achieved. How can I like get my painting to that level? And it's just a nice reminder. Sure. Sure. So, um, with, with the work that you do, um, you know, a lot of the times when I'm chatting with people on this podcast, I, you know, what's being done or worked on now is, is usually or um, kind of off limits topic. But I mean, for some of the past work that you've done, you've, you've worked on uh, how many of the Halo titles? Uh, I worked on Halo 5. Okay. And i um, working on the next one. Cool. And the process how long were you involved with or how long were you on the halo 5 project i came on board right as they were sort of ramping up into full production so all of the busy time okay um and then all the sustain so we did like a year of uh sort of uh download content sustain support to try to like keep the monthly active users high which was successful and that was a, a big um sort of initiative studio wide. And so that was a big effort. Um, but most of like a lot of work went into kind of, I'd say like the, the media of it was that production cycle at the end and, and working on, you know, paintings for like actual levels as opposed to like pre-production. Oh, so okay. I didn't do a lot of, I didn't do like a ton of pre-production work. So the differences on that is going to be, um, your building or you're designing more or less the the spaces the ip the the aesthetics way it's going to look versus the actual assets that will be somehow used in game is that right yeah or like yeah like or actual levels you know they're like okay we're making this level it's at this location like go versus um, pre-production is just um, way more um up in the air like more like, like more like setting the mood and the aesthetics and like we might want this type of a setting versus like actually these have to go here and you have to work within this dimensions or whatever. Yep. Yeah. 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 So like right now I'm in, you know, like for a long time I've been in pre-production mode in the next one. So it's like, I've worked on stuff that won't make it in the game, Sure, you know, that kind of thing. So on Halo five, like a lot of the stuff I worked, well, everything I worked on practically went right into the game and it was, you know, had direct impact. Very cool. So is that, is that more rewarding for you to be on the pre-production side of things at this point? Or does it not matter so much? It's not so much. It, you know, it's pros and cons on each side. It's like, it's cool, like, to do the exploratory blue sky stuff in the pre-production phase. And it's totally, you know, you just know it, chances are it's not going to make it in the game or it could get cut at any point. Um, and then on the other side, the flip side of that, like, you can work on sustained content, which is like shipping every month and then things get in the game or get, you know, get released right away. Uh, which is that's kind of fun too so like a super short cycle basically on that stuff yeah like yeah like on halo 5 sustain we designed and built a vehicle like in sustain and then we just shipped it it was just released you know a few months later so that's like a crazy example of like that's a super fast you know wow time frame to like create something and then ship it okay Versus like, usually it's like these assets are like, you know, take years of development. They're probably millions of dollars for all I know. Got it. And then, you know, by the time it gets released, your artwork that you created is like four years old. Oh man. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So for somebody who, and this is, this is a little bit bad, um, because I've speak, I've spoken with a lot of people who've worked on video games, but, um, my personal experience with them is, is so, so limited. I, I have at least played Halo, but it's been ages, ages. Um, nice. It, yeah, probably only the first one or maybe the second one, uh, if I was lucky. But um, so they were good. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They definitely left um, a mark. Like I still remember very vividly some of the the levels. Um, and 
So when you're talking about sustained, like, or sustained content, that's something that I, you know, I only played when I went over to friends' houses. So like, I, I didn't even own the gaming console, yeah. but what is, what is su sustained content? Is that, that stuff that, as far as I understand, it's released after the video game is already shipped? Yeah. So like now, you know, like back in Halo CE and Halo 2, it's like you buy the disc and you just play it and um, that's it. And now um, they release content. On, on Halo 5, they release content every month. Wow, okay. Like wow. And so it could be as simple as like um, weapon skins or armor skins or new weapons or new vehicles, but in, usually in like maps, like so they'll ship like a couple of new uh, MP maps or a new mode, uh, that sort of thing. And so um, it just it's just sort of the idea is to keep players engaged and, and to continue to like provide value to the, the product sort of as a service. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's work just due to the the advent of the internet, higher streaming speeds, I would assume, as well as, uh, is is this, this is, is or is not distributed through the, the Steam platform? I don't, I don't know. I uh, know it comes, it's all over Xbox Live. Okay, so that's, that's all Microsoft specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay, very cool. Yeah, Halo is really interesting as a um, as an IP, just because like the reason why Halo was successful was because, uh, or I should say, the reason why the Xbox was successful was because of Halo. Absolutely, yep. And, and then the same thing was true with Xbox Live. Like when Xbox Live was developed, it was shipping with Halo Two, I believe, and so it was like they were intrinsically tied together, and the success of the Xbox was you know, totally tied to, you know, Halo as the app. And, uh, yeah, so, like, it's just been, it's a really cool franchise just from, like, a sort of video game history perspective and, like, its impact of, like, it kind of shaped, you know, Xbox Live and, and this idea of, like, internet video gaming. Right, right. That's that's really cool because, yeah, when I think back to it, like, even with my very limited experience, like, that's it's always going to be um, the 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 first I think of and, and to think of now that like I was on Twitter just, I don't know, a few weeks ago or something. And like streaming live was like some championships. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and that was, you know, and I was just like, I watched for a few minutes. I was just like, this is crazy. I didn't even know that this happened uh, for the whole esports thing. So, um, yeah, esports is getting really big. It, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's mind blowing <laughs> as somebody who doesn't do it. I was just like, this is wild. Yeah, um, we have an esports component, but it's just like it's a, like a drop in the bucket compared to like what's going on out there. Like you look at um, Dota or League of Legends, and it's just the it's just crazy how big it is. I think I think like the thing, you know like the Dota um, Ti like the jackpots like uh, it's a lot of millions. Oh I my gosh! Oh oh, I don't. I think it's thirty. I better Google that. Oh. It's either I think it's thirty. It's crazy though. It's some it's some insane amount of money, and whereas like you know our Halo Championship Series is a million, which is great, wow. and so for it wow. it um it gets pro players in it. Um, is, is that pot is that pot just generated by a combination of uh, sponsors and like entrants, or is there are there totally is there way other ways that the re revenue is getting generated that's that's totally different? So on Halo, so like uh, we sold some rec packs which is like a microtransaction stuff mm -hmm. and a portion of the proceeds go into the pot okay okay and then uh there is i guess i um, we must put some money into it too but um maybe it's only three million i don't know it's millions of dollars nonetheless that's, that's really impressive <laughs> yeah. that's very cool um Cool. So, so were you, I mean, you mentioned that you've been a, a gamer for, or I don't know, I, I, I used that word. You didn't use that word, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah totally. okay. So you, so you were, you were deep into video games, um, well before you started thinking or realizing that you could, uh, pursue a career in entertainment. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't know it existed at the time. Right. right? That mean, makes sense. And it kind of didn't like when I first started at um, when I was in school and I went to work at that studio zombie in Seattle, mm -hmm. maybe it was a very, it's a small studio and having a concept artist um, was kind of crazy. Like they didn't see a need for it. 
And so I was kind of like there to sort of um, prove it sure. to them. You know what I mean? And it, at the time, they weren't really doing it. I mean, they wanted to do more sci-fi stuff that required you create stuff. But in the game industry, for sure, there was not there was not a lot of concept art. Sure. Like Bungie had one or two at the time, but that was, I mean, that was kind of crazy, a lot of them. But there just wasn't a ton. And now how many um, artists do you work with? Uh, I don't know if that's information you can share, but... I, how many artists do you work with on um, your current project? There's about 10 of us contributing right now, but it gets higher. Okay. Like, you know, when production uh, cycles ramp up and it varies every studio too. Like some studios are like much more, some studios have a couple teams, you know what I mean? Um, I've heard um, some in Europe that are just like, there's like, you know, teams, like there's like 30 concept artists, but they're like designing everything, every box, every Jeez. chair, everything. So it just depends on how you want to organize your pipeline. And do you want to spend time the thought, you know, do you want to spend time thinking about stuff and locking it down in 3d form or early on in 2d? Cause it'd be really, I think our outsourcing plays a role in it too. Um, like say for example, um, you have a, a set, a room and you want to outsource everything. It, then it would make sense to have like a bunch of concept artists who are just creating concepts of 2d images of everything in that room. And then just shipping it out for that to be, you know, created 3D. Sure. Got it. That's interesting. Yeah. So it kind of depends. We're probably not a huge team, but we're probably on, I'd say, average probably. Okay. And um, as far as uh, as far as Halo goes, is it is it going to be around for a real long time to come? Yeah. I mean, Halo, uh, the brand is really strong. Like, I mean, if you think about it, like, it's the kind of names like you ask like a grandma or a mom. It's just like a, it's a name they understand. Right. It's sort of like, it's like on par with like Pokemon, totally. you know, when you, when you like just bring it up casually in the culture. So, um, that carries a lot of weight, um, for the franchise. And yeah, I think that's the plan. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I mean, as we're, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably be wrapping this up here in a little bit, but there's a, there's a few questions, uh, perhaps a little less meandering that I'd like to hit up. Um, okay. so, uh, what's, um, it, it, what's been, um, some of the most influential, uh, either books or resources that you've really gotten a lot of value out of as you've developed as a, as an artist and a designer? Hmm. I'd say like good Books. Uh, I know this this kind of stuff probably gets um, thrown around a lot, but I mean, like uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Ten Thousand Hour Thing, um, just sort of like on the idea of like you know becoming proficient at something. Uh, I was just talking to someone the other day about The Alchemist, which is kind of a little more on the maybe the cheesy side, but just sort of like about you know sort of just kind of following your own path, um, and that's sort of just more like on. Like, you know, how, how do you sort of navigate your life? And then I'd say on like the art side, I was just, I got, um, really sucked into just like on the, on the Star Wars stuff. Right. I mean, I was a huge Ralph McQuarrie fan and Doug Chang. And when the, um, I think this is really common too, like, a when the prequel books came out, like those art of books, like that was just like, I think that, I mean, that kind of like helped fuel the explosion of concept art. Cause it just really show that it was like this rich sort of like thing you could be doing. It was a real, it was a real job, you know, like, and, uh, so yeah, those were, those had a big impact on me for sure. Cool. Yeah. There's definitely some good stuff in there. Um, I've read the alchemist a number of times and, um, well aware of the 10,000 hours, uh, or at least what the book is about. I've not actually read that one yet. So I might have to throw that on my list. Um, and then the, yeah, the, the, the art of books, um, I mean, I have, I don't know, at least one or two um, that I've just picked up. Not that I went out looking for them, but just like at a bookstore. I'm like, oh, this, yep, there it is. That's going in my cart. Um, yeah. But there seems like there's just tons of them too. Like, like not just like there's one for this movie and one for that movie. It's like, it seems like there's a ton of that material out there. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's just getting, it's, it's becoming more, um, normal you know or you know what i mean like just more i guess like on the 
you know, it's a coffee table book type of thing. Right. You know what I mean? But I, I just, I think people didn't know about it. Yep. You know, this, this kind of art has been created forever, but you know, you just went to the movie and you, you saw it and then that's all you thought about it. But there was really a team of people that were working on it. You know, it's like even like, unless you like stick through the credits and watch all those names and you really have no idea, you know, how many lives it affected. And so I think it's, it's kind of cool. Like if you're like, you know, to get into movies or games or whatever, to kind of like go to the next level and kind of like really understand the development process. And I think that's just kind of like, you know, maybe it has, maybe it's all tied with like Blu-rays and stuff, like just people getting access to just more content that they can consume about the the project. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, are there, so uh, are there any routines or habits that, that you do or maybe behaviors that you've just kind of picked up that um that help you create better or create more or just um just grind it out when you have to um i do yeah i find that like just sort of like fitness stuff helps me a lot um sort of clear clear head um it's or having whenever I'm like working out or doing, you know, doing something like I've done all sorts of things. I used to be really into like distance running oh, okay. and, and, uh, or then cycling. And I've kind of gotten out all, all these things that are sort of like injuring me slowly <laughs> over time. <laughs> <Yep>. But, um, <laughs> I, I just find that like having some way to, when I'm doing that sort of thing and I'm sort of like getting that runner's high or whatever, it sort of just frees my mind. And I, I can kind of like think more creatively in that moment, but also just like later on in the day. And it just, I don't know. I, I definitely think that's important. Like fitness is important and, you know, trying, trying to do that kind of thing. And I think that is something that's always like really helped me. I'd find that like, if I try to just like work more and like, you know, not take care of myself, then ultimately it ends up being bad. I'm like not in, you know what I mean? Like I'm just kind of like more depressed or I'm just like not going to be producing work as much as I would think I would do. I think it's like counterintuitive. Yeah. More is not always like, better. Not always there is a threshold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I find that like, if I just like take a break and do something to like clear my head, I'm actually way more effective than if I just kind of like, okay, I'm going to like skip the gym today and just like work. That's like, that's never a good idea usually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that's cool. Yeah. And I, I definitely know where you're coming from there. I mean, I'm, I assume, um, you know, you, you put in the hours in the chair at work too. I mean, you, you know, there's those hours add up and you kind of have to offset them a little bit as well. Um, so as far as, uh, advice you would give to people who maybe have come across your work, uh, regardless of what platform, but they're impressed with it and they may want to, uh, start working in that direction. Um, I mean, they've got an idea of kind of the path you took, but, um, what type of um, resources have you found or, or are you aware of any good resources that you would point people to who um, maybe are, don't have the opportunity to go to Art Center right now and um, enroll in Scott Robertson's uh, pilot program? <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, honestly, so it, there's challenges today, right? Because it's, you know, the, the, it's more saturated. It's harder to get going. But on the flip side, like these, like the Internet and all these resources on resources online, like just didn't exist. You know, it's like you had to go to school and spend like a hundred grand minimum mm -hmm. to sort of like, to sort of get the, get this knowledge back then. And so what's remarkable to me, what's so cool by the internet is that all this stuff is available. It's probably not all of it's for free, but you know what I mean? Like it's like, well, Gumroad is this platform that came along and now everyone's sort of sharing their sort of tips and tricks there. And, um, it definitely like, you know, kind of cuts straight to the core. Like if you just want to be an illustrator or a concept artist, like you could take a year or two, you know, if you were younger, you could sort of like figure out a way to do that and just dedicate to like learning stuff online and then save yourself, you know, the hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in education that, you know, like people my age and older were spending, you know what I mean? So that's, that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, yeah, to your point, I mean, there are tons and tons of courses out there, lots of people sharing stuff and, and for really, like you said, bite size costs, if not for free, which is awesome. Um, yeah. And I think that, that, that's, what's also important too. Like, 
it's it's also probably like I can imagine if I was a, a younger person, I would just be like overwhelmed by all the information. So it's probably really important to figure out more than ever, like what it is you want to focus on, you know what I mean? And just narrow it down and then just go for it that way, as opposed to just being like overwhelmed by all the resources and then taking, you know what I mean? I, I just, I, I could see that being a trap. Definitely. And, and I, I like that you bring that up because, um, I'm kind of right on the border. Like, um, I'm definitely younger than you, but I, cause I, I, I grew up mostly without the internet. And then around college was like when, High school, I mean, I used it in high school, but like I lived in the woods, we had dial up internet, like I didn't, did, just didn't use it, you know? And then it wasn't until I was really in college uh, and then the internet was like this resource that I just turned to for a lot of things. Um, and now, like you said, yeah, I, I, I think that is part of it is, is, is the overwhelm of like, log on to ArtStation or Behance or whatever your network is uh, of choice. And you just see so much work and so much good work it will kind of make your head spin. Um, you know, I guess trying yeah. to figure out where to go for a lot of people can be tough. Um, but I, I, I mean, I get, yeah, I mean, that, that is what's nice about an education track is they just funnel you in and you just go to your classes. Yep. Um, but if you are the type of person that can like, you know, figure that stuff out on your own and kind of guide your track and you could, you know, the potential to save, you know, so much money is just huge. Yeah. Like I'm kind of excited about that for my kids. Like when they get older, just be like, you, you know what I mean? Like having those resources available to them and not have to kind of like maybe not go a traditional route seems interesting to me. Cause that's something that I would have probably been interested in too. Definitely. I just, it just wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that is really cool. Um, on that note, of course, don't get in any specifics. Uh, but, um, is there, is there, for people who don't quite have an idea, um, is there still money to be made in um, films or the or or video games um, as somebody who's producing concept art or even production work? I guess. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> I think it's um, there's actually really good money in film work, and there's money in, in video games too, depending on the situation. All those companies are different. Um, but yeah, like the, you know, the, the people that are sort of at the top are making a really good rate. I think that's just the tricky thing is it's just kind of become, you know, like, uh, you know, a bit like the, maybe it's like the 80, 20 rule sure. or the 99% thing. It's just like, you have, um, a small percentage of the people who are just gathering most of the work, but there is a ways in, you know what I mean? So it's just like, you have to be really at it to get there. But for sure, I think. You know, it's, you could, you could easily, I think, you know, today go to art center, spend hundred, a thousand dollars, maybe more mm -hmm. 150 and get out and expect to pay your loans back in, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Sure. But sure. it's like, like, I don't think you're going to have the loans for like 30 years if you just want to really pay them off. Like when I got out, tuition wasn't that I I think it's like a lot higher. I think it was like around 14,000 when I got out. Oh, wow a semester and, and I just like worked really like I was working a lot. I was like working sometimes two or three jobs at a time and my wife was working and I mean, we paid it off. It took like a decade. It looked like a long time, yeah. but it's like, you know what I mean? Like it's doable. Yeah. It's just like, it just sucks. You have to like lower your, you know, your quality of life or whatever. And I, I, I sat with a guy too at um, IMD who did the same thing. And he was just like, he was living in LA. He was working in, film jobs making, you know, thousands of dollars a week, a great, great money. But he was just like living like, that, you know, practically in poverty. Yeah, that college so. lifestyle just to get the, yeah. But I mean, that's the thing is yeah. like you, uh, it's an investment of course, because you're doing that so you can enjoy what you do for the rest of your life, not be miserable. I mean, that's, that's, I think another thing is like, if somebody starts this and they are miserable, stop <laughs> before they get too right. deep. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah. But that's that's very interesting. By all means, please stop. Um, cool. Well, on that note, I mean, we've you know we've covered a lot. I really appreciate you. I mean, this episode's been um, a little bit more wandering, I think, than some of the previous ones. But I'm I'm still fairly new to this. Nice. So I'm trying to I'm kind of figuring this out. Um, you know, yeah. and and it's been fun. Like I really I you know I like uh, how willing you are to share um, your opinions on these things. So for anyone who 
wants to look up your work, uh, learn more, um, maybe learn from you, where where should they be? What are, what are the top uh, networks they should go or places to go to look your work up? Um, yeah, uh, probably just ping me on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. I have like a Facebook uh, page, Twitter account that I'm pretty active on. And I think that's it. I mean, I post on Tumblr too, but I don't think there's really great ways to interact with people there. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, feel free to ping me. Um, people do that all the time and I try to get back to them whenever I can. I also have like a FAQ page on my website that's like hidden in the about section. So if someone has like, um, questions, they could like look there first too. I will vouch for that. I found it. I read the whole thing. It's good. <laughs> you did a very good cool. job of, it's funny. I, when I was reading that, I get the idea. I'm like, Hmm, this guy's been asked a question once or twice in yeah. his career. All right. Uh, that's really smart. Yeah. That's I, I like I like that idea. Well, I didn't. Yeah, it, I kind of feel bad because like it it happened because I, I would start to get all these emails asking questions, and so finally I just collected uh, like a lot of the main ones and posted it there. And I hate to be like rude and be like, hey, check my FA, FAQ page, but it was just like I couldn't respond. You know, it's to all those. It's posts. better getting that type of response than none for somebody who is just desperate for something, you know, I guess. Um, so that's yeah. still cool. That's, that's nice. Um, I'll make sure I link those up actually, uh, for sure. Um, I'm going to make note the, uh, FAQ page because that I did, I, I thought that was pretty cool. I think people will find that interesting. So, um, cool. Cool. Well, the last thing I'm going to ask you is, um, are there any, um, projects that you're particularly excited to work on, whether they're personal or professional or anything else that you're, um, that's worth mentioning. Oh no. I mean like my stuff, my personal work is just kind of like gets, you know, posted up here and there, but, um, work wise, uh, we are working on some cool, yeah. cool stuff at the office. Hey, there's my three year old. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And these kids, I spent a lot of time that's with them. Right. Too. You've got, you've got how many kids? I have three boys. Oh, that's a handful. Do you want to say hi? Uh -huh. Okay. Do it. Okay, now go find mom. <laughs> Who was that? What? This is Luke. Oh, Luke. Nice to meet you. Okay, see you, buddy. <laughs> I don't think he's going to leave. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. That's all right. Well, we're wrapped up, man. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, thanks for uh, thanks for spending some time, and, and I'll let you get back to your family, man. Thank you. All right, yeah. Thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. All right, cheers. Take care. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Darren Bacon. If you want to read more or look at some of his work, maybe follow some of the links to things that he mentioned during this episode, those are all going to be in the show notes. And you can get the show notes at cgipodcast.com slash episode slash nine. Make sure you head over there. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, why not leave a review on iTunes or, um, or whatever platform you get your podcasts on? Uh, if you're new to this and you're not subscribed yet, if you go to cgipodcast.com slash subscribe, you can subscribe on like four or five other platforms. You can subscribe by email. Um, you can get all connected there. So um, make sure you let me know if uh, you like this episode. And um, until next time, this is Will Gibbons signing off.